The Christmas lights are starting to go up on my street. House after house has begun to make our short days and early nights a little bit brighter. They are pretty lights, twinkling and blinking and flashing. Tis the season to decorate and make things look a little more merry. To celebrate. We in the Christian church are anticipating the coming of Christ, the baby born in a manger who will save the world. We are anticipating the first coming of Jesus, which happened all those years ago. Yet our passage today from the gospel talks about the going out of the lights, the sun, the moon, the stars going dark, and heavenly realms shaking. It's apocalyptic. It's about the end of the age. And it doesn't seem very Christmassy. Yet, it's about the coming day when Christ will return. From humble beginnings in the little town of Bethlehem, Christ will return with great power and great glory, riding on the clouds. This is the day when Jesus will come as the King of kings and Lord of lords. When according to Revelation, we will have a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21 describes heaven this way. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the former things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. That is quite the vision. The dwelling place of God will be with mankind. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. This is what we mean when we say in the liturgy, we await his coming in glory. Christ has come. Christ will come again. That is why in Advent we practice waiting, anticipating. We practice what the text says, is being on guard, staying awake, keeping watch. Because the holiday spirit that people talk about, what Christmas is really about, is much more than twinkle lights and gift giving. It's even more than visiting family and our traditions. It's about the coming of a savior, whom we call the light of the world. As Christians, we can reflect upon the end, whether it, whether it is our own end or the end of the world. It is a scary thought for most people. The description in the text of the lights going out, the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars, is mortifying. Yet this image is at the same time the day we as Christians can nevertheless yearn for. Because this return of Christ, when we meet our maker, is when we meet the one who is the source of light and life. And we need that, desperately. For all the electricity we throw at it, without Christ, this season we're in is very dark. For all the twinkling lights and the beauty that we can muster, the season is rife with consumerism, sadness, and loneliness. Christmas is the time when we have to put our faith in something more substantial, something eternal, something that will outlast our temporary celebrations, something that will outlast our Canadian winter, something that will be there at our end and at the end. That something is Jesus. Our eternal hope is the person of Christ. The amazing thing about Christmas is that unlike the mythologies of Santa Claus and reindeer and elves, which are fun, we have something real, something that is serious and seriously joyful. We sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Our glorious Jesus is our savior, and he did not humble himself to come into the world just to help people be a little nicer, or to encourage people to be more charitable in their giving. He may inspire our good works, but he is here for more than that. 
He is here for the salvation of the entire world. The Son of God came to make straight every crooked way, to right every wrong, to upend every injustice, and to reconcile all things to himself. That is why we look to his coming again in glory. That is why we remember Advent, not just as the coming of Christ once, but the coming of Christ again, the second Advent, the return of Christ. That is what we are waiting for and yearning for. But what does it look like for you and I to wait, to anticipate his coming not knowing when it will be? I believe the key to this passage and the answer to that question is verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, it says, but my words will not pass away. This is Jesus talking. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus here is equating his words with God's. He's reminding us of who he is. His words have the same power as the voice that spoke, let there be light, and there was light. Here is the scripture, the word of God, presented to us as something eternal, ever-present, everlasting. There's something about the words on the pages of our Bible that are more durable, more steadfast than the foundations of the earth. It makes sense when you consider that John described Jesus this way. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I believe that waiting, staying awake, and keeping watch requires our eyes to be open to see God. What does it mean to actually see, to actually pay attention? Jesus describes it this way in the Gospel of Matthew. For this people's heart has grown callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Will we be the people that see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn to be healed by Jesus? Will we turn to Jesus by opening up our Bibles and finding him in his word? Will we turn to that which is eternal, and use it as the authority of our lives. Turn to Jesus for the first time, for the thousandth time, in prayer. Will we turn to Jesus and be healed? In our gospel reading for today, Jesus uses a parable as a warning to his disciples. He says, It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. A doorkeeper only unlocks the door for welcome visitors and for the master when he returns. The disciples at the time were likely to see themselves as the servants. Their task was to protect the church, the property of the master, from false prophets and false teachings. You may think that we're a bit removed from any false prophets these days, Nowadays, it's more likely that someone who says they are a messiah is going to be locked away rather than start a following. But I wonder if perhaps the real threat to our faith today is more insidious than that because it is more subtle. We may not know anyone with a messiah complex. That would be too obvious. But perhaps there are things we have nevertheless started to treat as our messiah, things we look to as our savior because it's easier to have something tangible in the absence of the master. Anything that threatens to supplant Christ as the center of our lives and the center of our faith is a false prophet, a false teaching. And the thing with false prophets and false teachings is that they claim to be just as good or even better than the real thing. But they don't deliver. They promise things they'll never fulfill. Jesus Christ offers us the spiritual salvation we need. But we need salvation from loneliness, too, and mental illness, and addiction, and suffering. God delivers his people today like he delivered his people through the wilderness. That wasn't just a nice story for the people of Israel. 
Egypt wasn't just a metaphor for them. They needed real deliverance. They needed real salvation. And we do at Holy Trinity, too. I've listened to many people who have described for me their concern for Holy Trinity. There is a love for this place and a worry that it might not continue. There is a desire to see it become important in the hearts of the next generation, in the same way it was important to the last. There is faith here and an understanding that what was so valuable, so close to the heart, so transformational for so many people, ought to be shared. It ought to be popular, or growing, or at least bigger. I need to reassure you, this may be your church, but this is first and foremost Christ's church. The master may be away, but our task is not to forget whose house this is. We are to keep watch, to have open eyes and soft hearts, and remember whom we ultimately serve. We serve the Master. We serve Jesus Christ. He is the one we're waiting for and hoping for. He's the one that delivers us and keeps his promises. He is what we're here for. He is the one that will save us. Our Old Testament reading for today included this verse. It's one of my favorites. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. I believe that what matters as we move forward as a church is our ability to look to Jesus as the potter. My prayer is that what we allow to shape and form us are Christ's hands. It requires faith and patience and the ability to be still and know that he is God. It requires being willing to submit to change. There are a hundred thousand ways to do church, and there are no end to the good ideas out there. But our job as servants, as doorkeepers, is to keep watch for the master. How does he call us? Where does he want to lead us? We can only see him coming if we keep our eyes open and our hearts soft. Amen.